No. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. Yeah. So, so just just FYI, this is my first time ever really doing a tech talk. So, to have to be following up uh, the legend, uh, Dr. Abstract here is uh, quite the privilege, quite the honor. And uh, thanks, thanks, Rick. Thanks, thanks, Crete and Tio. Thanks everybody for coming. So, let's get right to it. My name is Steve Dibo, and I'm about to subject you to a bit of backstory. Who am I? <laughs> Haven't changed a bit. Um, so when I was very young, um, I was always like kind of a design geek. Uh, it was only later in life I, I met other ones, but there was a long time when I was like the only design geek around, and I thought I was really weird for being a design geek, for having opinions about things, and engineering, and stuff like that and like I could tell you uh, what a car was coming down the street just by the shape of the headlights like I could I, I preferred American pay phones to Canadian ones because the buttons felt better when I was like seven so this is this is the kind of guy you're dealing with here and I was a bit of a tinkerer like I like to try to figure out how things how things work and so so I broke a lot of shit so it's just a quick list of just things I could remember breaking when I was a kid a lot of stereos um, at least like four or five like family like living room stereos. Remember your family had like a stereo in the living room? Yeah, I broke a bunch of them. Uh, I had a toy robot. I tried to give it a bath one time. <laughs> and I, I, d I made myself a telephone extension in my bedroom, but before I did that, Bell had to come two or three times and fix the overloads and the short circuits and things, uh, splicing the phone line with a butter knife and all this, all this shit. Uh, I took apart my brother's dirt bike one day because I wanted to see how the carburetor worked. That was, he, he, I don't know if he's ever forgiven me for that. And like a bunch of clocks, watches, and things like that. I would see how the gears worked. And, um, mostly, my, my explorations into how things work dealt mostly with like destroying things. Not really so much fixing things. Um, over the years, we didn't have a lot of money. So this was in like the late 80s, early 90s. My mom would come home with a, like, like TRS-80 from a garage sale or like a VIC-20 or something. And, Here's a computer, and I'd play with it for a bit, and then I'd get bored with it, I'd get bored with doing basic, and then I would just start taking it apart, and then it would stop working. And Oh, another uh, famous old computer I, I broke was my Uncle Adele's Apple II. Um, I was taking that apart <laughs> without his permission. I never had anybody's permission for any of this. Um, took out the floppy drive, and I, I put the floppy drive cable back in the wrong way around. Yeah, that, that burns out the motherboard. <laughs> on an Apple II. It was only an Apple II clone, but you know. Anyway, uh, something special happened to me in 1997. Do you remember that movie? I found a computer in the trash. Well, not really a whole computer, but kind of, this is another one. This isn't the same computer, but it was, it was like that. It was missing a lot of parts. And like, I was sick of those VIC-20s and garage sale computers. I was like, this is a real computer. I just got to figure out how to fix it. What do you do in the 90s? When you need to learn how to fix a computer, you buy a book. <laughs> you, you learn how, you, and I figured, oh, it doesn't have RAM, it doesn't have a hard drive, it doesn't have a, a CD-ROM a sound card controller thing. So with a little bit of help and a, maybe another f book or two, I, I managed to get it all together. Suddenly I, I had, for very little money, I had a computer. And I, I consider that to be kind of my first moment of like actual tangible technological creation. And I, I guess that kind of inspired me in a way, because I kept going with it. With that computer, I got a little modem, and I got like a CompuServe uh, free trial. Never did the AOL thing, did CompuServe. And um, then I got on the web, and I started like learning this, this new thing called HTML, way back in 1997. And I stuck with it. And it, I didn't really go to college. I went to visual arts. I smoked, just smoked a ton of weed. Like, I didn't graduate. Don't tell my boss that. <laughs> but yeah, I got into UI development. I got into web design. So I started making sort of those nice buttons and things that I always liked so much as a kid. I was able to apply some of those opinions that I had into things that looked and felt good, that people got delight from using. This is a touch screen that I did in 2013 in uh, Windows WPF for uh, Rich Tree Natural Markets in the Eaton Center. And um, that's for like the ordering, kind of like the same thing they have at McDonald's. Actually, if you go to the one at McDonald's, 
looks exactly like that. Yeah, don't want to <laughs> don't want to be too conspiratorial here, but you know. Yeah, so I moved to Toronto from Montreal about five years ago, and it was a really great thing for me because although I was doing professional web development in Montreal, it was kind of small potatoes and. I wasn't really getting in touch with like the community. I wasn't doing meetups like this. I wasn't meeting people. Well, I was lucky because the reason I moved to Toronto is I started working at a company called Infusion. And at the time, the guy who was running our department was a guy named Mark Pelland. Mark Pelland had some friends and they had their own creative technologist group. I hope this video plays. <laughs> so yeah, if you recognize the venue, this is Handlebar. This is what they were doing back in 2013, and this is Creative Technologists of Toronto playing their Pie Fighter game. And the Pie Fighter game was like, two people had to sit here, and their like, assistant player on the other side had to use a neural interface to play a game. And whoever won, didn't, or whoever lost, I should say, got the pie. It was completely whimsical, and this blew my mind. I was just, uh, I just realized I moved to the right city, you know? <laughs> and so I got involved with them and I started helping them make stuff. And um, this is something that we got around to doing a little bit later that, that very same year. Uh, this is kind of like a duck hunt thing where you play it with your, your phone's camera. Uh, at the time, anybody could go onto like the Android Play Store, they could get the app, and then if they, had, if they went to the place where the game was set up, they could point their phone and the reticle like a gun and they could shoot ducks off the screen. The ducks would fall off the screen. There'd be multiple ducks, multiple players. And it was just like a great piece of like, I don't know, installation art? Anyway, um, I had the privilege of being able to make like some of the menus and some of the graphics. And um, Wesley over there, uh, he made the backgrounds and like the ducks and stuff. And so it was great to be a part of a team and do stuff like that. But I wasn't really doing any of the heavy lifting. I was doing the look and feel and the UI and stuff like that. The other guys, they were doing all like the crazy JavaScript, programming Arduinos, do all kinds of crazy things. And I really admired them for that. Uh, it took me a while to get into, um, oh, here's another one that we did actually. I threw this video in as well. This is a diorama, diorama rama project that we did, which was actually a, a workshop where we got people to like put together a little circuit on a little board, program it with a Morse code message and flash a light. Then they got to build a building out of origami and stick it on a board and choose their place, choose their building, choose their message, customize it. And we set that up at like an FITC conference as like a, a running workshop. So we, we got soldering irons in the hands of people and like I learned how to do a bit of soldering at the time. And like, so I was getting exposed to a lot of new stuff, you know? Uh, and Toronto was good for me in a lot of other ways. I got involved a lot more with photography. I took, took, took a lot of photos. Um, more recently, I've met a bunch of really cool people and we started an art collective and now we publish a zine. And another just thing on the side, I started fixing my own, my own flat tires and fixing the chain on my bike and stuff like that and doing small repairs. And kind of what I consider my overall hobbies are, are right here in front of you. So let me just jump over really quickly to how this idea sort of came about. Um, like a lot of things, you know, I like hanging out with Wesley and we're just talking and I don't know, I think I maybe ran into a video on YouTube or something of somebody who had like a little arcade machine. I was like, that's cool, man. Like probably between us, we have like the knowledge we could make something like that. Eh? And like, yeah, yeah, well, that's good. And then we maybe we didn't mention it again for a couple of months. And you know how it goes, you know, you talk about doing this like mini arcade one day, you think about it, you put it on the back burner, right? So, a couple of months ago, a <laughs> couple of months ago, I'm in the Value Village with my girlfriend, and uh, I came across this thing, $25. I was like, what the hell is this? And so I Googled it really quickly on my phone while I was there. Turns out, it's an iPad accessory. It's called an Ion iCade. And this, this is a product that came out in like 2010, 2011. It was one of those like Think Geek April Fool's jokes. And then they were like, well, the response is so good, we could actually make this thing. And so at the time, you could get like an, an Atari uh, compilation in the uh, Apple App Store that would work with this device. It would connect over Bluetooth, 
And because iOS doesn't actually support joysticks, the iCade would just send keyboard commands to it. So you pull the, the joystick to the left, it's like a lowercase l. You let go of it, it's like a lowercase k. All the buttons, like if you, it just like produces keyboard commands. And so the, the games had to be specifically written to support this thing. You couldn't just use any game. And so for a couple of years, yeah, you had this nifty thing in the corner of your, your office that you could like impress people with, play little asteroids or something, you know? But then after a couple of years, it ends up in Value Village. So I, I did a little more Googling even before I bought it, and I realized, yeah, people convert these things. There, are, there is a way, there's like an Instructables article for how to convert these things to work with a Raspberry Pi. You buy your own display. Maybe you do a little bit of like acrylic work, and you, like, you cover it up, and you, you put your own custom artwork on it. Some of these people went pretty far with it, as, as you can see. And I was like, oh, well, I'm definitely buying this thing. So I bought it, and I put it up in my office in the corner and started collecting dust, put it on the back burner again. Couple of months. So, motivation problem, motivation solution, right? I've always admired these CTT people, creative technologists. They have amazing work ethic. They have something that I don't. They, they don't have an off switch. There's real, not really any such thing as downtime. For me, it's like where you work nine to five, you've earned your downtime. You sit down, you do fuck all, maybe you watch a movie or something. But then they would work on their personal projects and they were just, yeah, we do group projects, but then they would do these personal projects. The personal projects would always get done because very few moving parts. You didn't have to get the whole band together to like work on this thing or have a meeting or anything. You just labor of love. You just like sat and did it. And I'm wondering, how can I do this for myself? You know, this idea, now I've got this like arcade cabinet. How do I make it happen? Well, if you pay, if you pay attention, you will find opportunities in your life where you can impose a deadline and you can make it matter. In the case of the arcade machine, I'm on the social committee at where I work now and we sit down and we plan like parties and events and stuff at work. And we just reached 80 employees a couple of months ago and we decided to have an 80s theme party and we were just talking, oh, music, we're gonna have Thriller and people are gonna be having teased hair and asked to wash jeans and shit. And Somebody was like, wouldn't it be great if we had like Pac-Man or something? And I raised my hand. And I said, I can do that. And so the party had a date. Now I had a deadline. I can do a lot of wonderful things if I have a deadline. Um, I've always been taking photos. I don't think I've ever done something like this before until I had that structure, until I had some accountability and a deadline. And I can actually sit there and kind of have a little bit of pressure on. Like, there's some stakes on this. I, I need to do this, you know? So the zine's got a deadline. Now the arcade machine's got a deadline. By the way, this presentation had a deadline too. Let's talk about the build. Basic system components I'm gonna go through with you right now. This is basically the cabinet here. This is just maybe four pieces of MDF like screwed together. This part is a plastic joystick controller. Inside it's got eight buttons. It's got one arcade stick. Um, and it's got this like controller board that would interface with the, the iPad, the Bluetooth. In the conversions, they basically say like buy this controller board. It's like a common, you can get on Adafruit or even Amazon has it. And uh, rewire the controller up and hook it up to this guy. And plug it into your Raspberry Pi and then basically just a USB joystick. So, and actually you see all the, all the plugs are like, they're just like sockets. It's like you don't even really need any soldering. And so I thought, yeah, I could probably do this, you know? This is what powers the whole thing. This is a Raspberry Pi. More specifically, this is a Raspberry Pi kit. It has the main board here, comes with a case, a power supply, a couple of heat sinks, comes with an HDMI cable, which is handy, um, SD card reader, other, other little extras. And that kit together is probably about 100 bucks. I'm gonna go over the cost of all this stuff at the end of the presentation, by the way. Uh, a little 10.1 inch monitor. About 110 bucks on Amazon. Uh, grab your tape measure, make sure it fits. And the idea is eventually it's gonna be mounted vertically, so you want something that has like a nice flat profile on the back. And actually, this particular model of monitor has some other surprises in store that actually turn out to really help me out, and I'll, I'll get into that a little more later. Uh, if you wanna do two-player, or you wanna have a more authentic gaming experience on consoles, you probably wanna get a couple of these. Uh, these are actually Raspberry, Raspberry Pi uh, USB uh, controllers and they sell them as a pair. 
Because like a lot of people do this thing where they use Raspberry Pis for emulation, so it's a, it's a popular package on Amazon. You find a pack like this, 20 bucks. These are great little controllers. They're just like SNES controllers. I decided to go a step further, and I also s I searched high and low, and I found this thing just to stick on the back, just so I have somewhere to put the controllers. And that's actually like a cargo net for like the, the back of a seat of a car or something like that. So those are basically all the components that, that go into this thing. So the first thing you do is, without even considering the case at all, you plug everything together, make sure everything works. You know, you got a test rig here. So I'm not going to go really into any detail about the actual system that, that runs on top of the Raspberry Pi, but there's a wonderful software package you can download an image of, image straight onto the SD card. It's called RetroPy. And so it's built on the Raspbian sort of pared down Linux that, that, that the Raspberry Pi uses. Um, it also has uh, like a, a library, a, a retro gaming emulation library, uh, GUIs and common, imp common input configurations, common display configurations, and a launcher for the whole thing. So you can collect all your games, have like a nice menu to play with. You can even theme it. And obviously, uh, you know, the question of getting the games and all that is like, well, I can't really tell you where to get the games, you know. If you want to, like, there's a lot of people who have, like, a hobby homebrew thing where they, like, make a new Atari game stuff. This stuff is freely available online. Also, there's archive.org, which is, has an ongoing sort of classic game collection initiative. Uh, most of the systems that they collect for are basically extinct. So it's not like you're going to find, like, an old arcade machine that runs, like, or, or an old Vectrax. These things are hard to come by. Um, if you wanted to go and play, I don't know, Game Boy Advance games and stuff, you, you could do that too. But um, long story short, don't steal shit, okay? So let's, let's get into it. Let's crack open that joystick and let's perform some surgery. So underneath it all, um, you've got like basically a bunch of, you've got a controller where you've got a bunch of wires and, and shit like that. Uh, while I had it open, I noticed like, well, this thing's going to be a problem. This little doodad here, which is meant to hold, it, all it does is just hold the iPad in place. There's also a channel through it where you put like the charging cable. Because like I said, this is a Bluetooth device, so there isn't actually any wired connection by default. Uh, but what there is is a lot of extra plastic crap inside the case that needs, it basically needed to go because my wiring job and my new board like doesn't fit in here with all this, it's very cramped in there. So. Actually, with the help of my neighbor, Adam, he's got like a Dremel and all this stuff in his basement. We cut this thing off. We cut the battery thing off. And we also sort of made a little extra space here. And this is basically just so I can channel the wires up here and install the monitor and so you don't have to see the wires because I care about design. I care about aesthetics. So uh, this is what the, the wiring, the new wiring job looks like. It's actually not too bad. Uh, one, of the, one of the interesting difficulties I faced by the way, no soldering involved whatsoever. Um, later on, I will solder it just to make it a little more like robust. But like these posts here are a bit too wide for, for these like connectors, the connectors that came with the, the USB board. And so all I did was I just took like a pair of tin snips. And I just cut there, jam that guy on, works fine. You mount all the components onto the case now and add your finishing touches. So the, the first iteration of it had the Raspberry Pi mounted on the back like this. Um, later on, I decided it's actually better to mount it down here like that for two reasons. One, it hides the wires better. And two, I actually am going to use this space for something else later, as you'll see. And it's, what's really neat about this thing is there's actually a lot of space under here to do things. So you can easily mount your thing. You can have decent cable management. You can see here, that's the USB board right there in the hole that we dremeled. And um, everything fits together pretty nice. Those are the cables coming up there. I've covered this with a piece of black, just a piece of black paper, make it look nice, you know? And then uh, mount the monitor on it. It's really, there's not much to this, you know? So then in the back, oh here, this is another application of paper where I just use it to like channel the wires in so you don't have to deal with like having the wires like stick outside here. The last thing I did was I just mounted like the car, a little cargo net in the back, stuck the controllers in the back, keep them tidy. And then um, just for simplicity, I, I gave the buttons some labels and assigned them, sort of similar to like a Super Nintendo controller. And uh, I mean, the software almost just configures itself. It's like that easy. 
And so this is a video of um, the successful first play of the, uh, of the mini arcade machine over at Wesley's house. He's playing Puzzle Bobble, I think. <laughs> That's Agent Cooper. That's his kitty. So I did it. I, I got this thing together. I delivered it to the party. Everybody was really happy, and everybody got to play some old games, Donkey Kong, Dig Dug, Pac-Man, all that stuff. And I got that creation moment again. I, 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 I finished a project, and I started feeling like maybe I could take on another project, you know? So let's just, just real quickly go over the cost here. The initial thing I set up when I did the party was basically the arcade cabinet from Value Village, John's Raspberry Pi kit, which I borrowed from him, the 10.1 inch screen from Amazon, the USB and quarter, quarter board, about 150 bucks. Pretty good. Then I decided to put some frills on it. I got my own Pi, I got my own game pads, I got the cargo net, and I got a slim profile HDMI cable because the one that came with the Pi was like, wouldn't fit and wouldn't be hidden nicely but behind that thing. So now my total is about 330 bucks all in. And that's it. So this portion of the talk will be me simply turning it on and showing you that it works. One of the really sweet things about this monitor <laughs> is that, yeah, there it is. <laughs> what I didn't realize is, yeah, it has speakers on the back of it. It has a volume control and all that. When I plugged in the HDMI, I wasn't expecting sound to come out of it. And then I turned on a game and it started playing sound. I got the sound for free. Big freebie. But not only that, I realize there's like a USB port on this monitor. It's meant to be like a media player. You can play like videos and stuff on it. But yeah, you can also plug the Pi into it. Now you've got a power switch and a power source, all with the monitor. Big freebie. I thought I'd have to think about all these things. I didn't have to. So yeah, I mean, there's um, the Instructables courses usually involve going to Adafruit, getting this board, and then getting a sound controller that connects to the GPIO on the Raspberry Pi. You could do that. Or you could just go to Amazon. You can get this guy. So, um, yeah, what we're looking at here is the, um, the RetroPie, um, sorry, emulation station launcher. And it basically organizes all the games here by console. Let's try Game Boy. See, there's a ridiculous amount of Game Boy games here. But you can, you can also jump ahead here. Here, jump, jump to L. I don't know if you guys can really super see this very well, but you'll just have to strain a bit. Let's go to Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. Oh, let's get the sound going too. Yeah, one, actually one of the reasons I didn't want to do the acrylic thing was because, well, I've got these great buttons here. Why would I mess with a, with a good thing, right? So this, this was one of my favorite games when I was a kid. I played this, I really gutted this game. So yeah, there it is. Zelda on uh, Game Boy. So yeah, you can play anything like two player, you can play arcade, you can even do three player, multi-tap, stuff like that. It's really awesome. So yeah, just to talk a little bit about my future plans for this thing and sort of some of the existing bugs that are on it. Like right now, um, because it's three USB controllers, there's like this one and there's two of these, it sees it as player one, two, and three. What I would like is this and this to both be player one. But the way that RetroArch is configured, you can't do that yet. So I need to either figure out some way around, some way to around that, talk to one of the developers, get into the config files, see if there's a way. But I would like it so that you could have the option of either doing this or this with zero configuration. Um, another thing I would like to do is actually machine some holes, like get a drill press machine to mount the monitor with actual screws. Right now it's just got mounting tape. The mounting tape is not the best. I mean, it survived the trip here. Hope it survives the trip back. Um, some additional buttons because, for example, on arcade games you need to insert coins and stuff. Um, right now, in order to support that, you need to plug in an external, like a keyboard. And you, you have to like press one to insert coins. You can press it 99 times, you have 99 credits, but you, you need like some other buttons to, to operate an arcade. Um, and custom artwork, you know, like you see what some of the other people have done with it. I'd like to make some sweet like 
v synth wave, vapor wave kind of thing with like a purple DeLorean or something. You know? Yeah, so that's that's basically uh, that's it. Um, let me turn this guy off. He's starting to annoy me. Okay, so just a quick preview of some other projects here I'm thinking of now that I've got like one project under my belt. I, I, I ran into this um, rotary phone on buns. I got it for like 10 bucks, and it's actually from 1959. I was able to determine. And um, it won't work on any landline or anything like that these days, but you can get like an Arduino, and you can get like a telephone system, and you can make it do things. You can, ma you can dial with it and make it go play. You can connect it to make it play audio files based on what you dial. You can make it ring. Maybe you can attach it to a motion sensor, make it ring when someone goes in the room. Lots of ideas there, right? So I'm thinking, get that system going. That's the small idea. Maybe the big idea is perhaps some sort of uh, game that draws you in. Something like that, right? <laughs> That's it for me. Now, I don't know if anybody has any questions. I'd love to be able to open it up to a couple of questions from the audience if anybody has one before I log off for the night. Yes? That is, anybody who runs Linux will be familiar with that. Um, that's basically just like Linux loading all its services and giving you status okay and all that stuff. Kind of like how back in DOS days, DOS would say like loading this, loading auto exec dot bat and all that. Linux still does that. <laughs> so, on though there's a, if uh, you can disable the splash screen and you just see the whole thing run down the screen, it's like loading the kernel, loading the drivers, loading the services, etc. Anybody else? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, yeah, there is a one line of config in um, for RetroPie that will just enable. Uh, the vertical orientation. However, the, gra the GPU on the Raspberry Pi doesn't support a 90 degree rotation natively, so it does it in software. And something you'll notice if you start to use the machine a little bit is that there's a, uh, do you see there's a little bit of diagonal like screen tearing? It's, it's kind of hard to, to visualize on the menu. It's not a big issue with old school games because there's not a whole lot of pixels moving around, but there is like a small like performance hit when you run it vertically. I'm anticipating there'll be a later hardware version that'll fix that. For now, it's just kind of like a small compromise I'm totally willing to deal with. But it basically, there's like a retroarch.cfg file, and you see display rotate equals one. It's like that easy. Yes, Potter? <laughs> I actually thought of that. It just seems like a kind of a a big solution to a small problem. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's, I don't want to start cutting into my USB cables. But yeah, if I get desperate, I guess. We'll, we'll see if they if I can figure something out in software first. So with that, I'm going to let you guys get back to your drinking and carousing. And thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, everybody, for paying attention. The machine is on. Feel free to come and have a play. Two players available. You've got a friend. And uh, enjoy your night, guys.